Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar. I'm actually uh, here at uh, school um, in our lab, and I thought I'd just start on a series of videos. Uh, these will be uh, relating to actually a, a request. Um, someone sent me a request uh, that I talk about uh, a certain subject um, that that he uh, at least wanted to discuss in a little more detail. And that is, is this topic is actually rather important uh, throughout all of medicine, and this is not specific just to respiratory care, and that is this concept of, of hemodynamics, hemodynamic monitoring, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm just going to write up here uh, hemodynamics. Hemodynamics. I'm going to... We'll just try to get uh, some, some sort of um, intuitive uh, understanding of, of actually what hemodynamics um, entails. Uh, as you can see, I'm actually recording from my iPad um, from the front-facing camera, so everything is going to come up with kind of uh, backwards on there. Uh, but there isn't going to be a whole lot of math and, and so on and so forth uh, for this, this initial video, so you don't have to worry about that too much. So... What is hemodynamics really? Well, if we break it down into to hemo, of course we're talking about the, the blood, or more specifically we're talking about um, how the blood moves uh, because that is what we mean by dynamics. So, so literally what hemodynamics is is how blood moves or circulates uh, through the body. So it's really the, the, the dynamic processes or process that occurs as we have a circulation. And uh, generally what that's going to involve when we do monitoring is it's going to involve some sort of pressure. As we know, there are many different pressure gradients throughout our circulatory system. And if you remember uh, from you know, your basic, um, perhaps basic physics, anatomy, physiology, so on and so forth, really we need to have gradients uh, for flow to occur. And you guys uh, probably remember uh, some of my videos um, on some of the, the, the respiratory concepts of, of flow. And I talked about this concept of driving pressure. And it's the same concept in the body. I can't have a uniform pressure throughout um, all, the, all the compartments, all the vessels of my body. I have to have a gradient of pressure. And I, you know, I have to have something where I have an area of, of high pressure here. We have, let's just say that this is a vessel. I need to have an area of high pressure um, and an, an area of lower pressure. And the difference, the delta P, the difference in pressure between those two areas is what's known as, as the driving pressure. Um, and and that, that gradient is what uh, drives the flow of a fluid um, through a certain area, a certain vessel. Um, so when we talk about hemodynamic monitoring, we're going to be monitoring um, pressures in different areas of the body, and that's actually where it becomes really confusing is what is a normal pressure, what is, what is normal for a certain area of the body. Um, before I actually get into monitoring, I just want to emphasize that hemodynamic monitoring, all this invasive stuff that we talk about in school, pulmonary artery catheters and uh, central lines and, and arterial lines and so on and so forth, in my mind, all those modalities are peripheral. Um, they provide peripheral information, and the primary information about hemodynam uh, hemodynamic status uh, really should be uh, derived clinically, uh, at least initially. And what I mean by that is we need to get hands-on. You need to get your hands on a patient, and you need to assess your patient. Uh, and that's so somewhat of a, of a lost art, a dying art these days, putting hands on patient. We're, we're more interested in the number. Um, the numbers should always, the, the numbers that we get from all these should always um, verify or back up what we find clinically. Um, so if I assess somebody and I, I, I notice something on that assessment, I can use the numbers to, to either uh, verify um, my, my um, suspicion or what we call a differential diagnosis to, to either verify that, to, to add credence to it, or to perhaps... Um, make us think about other things, but um, it should always be the, the clinical assessment. Um, it should always be how our patient presents clinically. And some of the things we want to look at um, initially are, are, are going to be things like level of consciousness, mentation, and affect. Um, because, uh, as we know, the brain receives circulant, uh, a, um, 
a, a rather large amount of, of perfusion. The, the brain is, is, is not um, very labile. The tissue doesn't have um, a whole lot of um, a wiggle room, if you will, uh, for hypoxia. Not like other tissues in our body, which can tolerate hypoxia uh, fairly well. Um, neurons don't. They don't have reserves uh, so they require uh, constant uh, circulation, constant supply of oxygen. Um, so that's one of the first things that we may notice in somebody who has altered hemodynamics is that they're, they're going to have some sort of, of change in their mentation, their affect. And another thing, uh, obviously pale skin, cool, clammy, um, the, the characteristic shocky uh, signs and symptoms. However, uh, something that I actually find is very important, another organ system that sometimes we can overlook is, is actually the renal system, the kidneys. Now, in, in a normal person, the kidneys receive about 20% of the cardiac output. Now, 20% of your, your total cardiac output goes to the kidneys. So when I have a, a state where my hemodynamics are altered, one of the, the, the cardinal things that will, will occur, one of the, the important things that will happen is my kidneys will not be perfused. If my kidneys are, are not being perfused, my, renal, my, my urinary output is, is going to decrease substantially. So monitoring that urinary output is actually going to be very important and give us a lot of information about the hemodynamic status. And in fact, there are um, a, a, some people, uh, myself included sometimes, that say that a Foley catheter uh, for monitoring urine output is is the poor man's swan gans catheter and what is a swan gans catheter if you don't know we'll talk about it a little later on but it really is it can provide us a lot of good clinical information if the kidneys are being perfused well that means they're receiving a lot of cardiac output and it generally means that my hemodynamic status is is doing well um, what is a normal urinary output uh, I go kind of by the guideline of about one milliliter per kilogram per hour uh, some people throw in a range of about 0 0.5 to 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour. Um, I just generally go, you know, if I have a 70 kilogram patient, I would like to see around 70 milliliters of, of, of uh, an hour of urinary output. Okay, so we've kind of gotten that over, over with. Let's just talk about the three um, traditional modalities that come to mind when we talk about hemodynamic monitoring. And those, those three modalities are going to be monitoring very different aspects of, of the body and the circulatory system. And they include the pulmonary artery catheter. Uh, sometimes uh, you may hear this called the, the balloon tip flow directed pulmonary catheter. Um, it's also known as the Swan Gans catheter. Uh, several different names for the, the, um, the same modality. Now, that catheter is actually, um, uh, when it's properly inserted, will actually. Um, exist uh, within the, the pulmonary artery. Um, obviously, it'll go through the right side of the heart and the pulmonary artery, and we'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, the second thing that we run into is something called the central venous pressure, and we will monitor that through a central line. We're actually not looking at an artery with the central venous pressure. We're looking at the venous system, and that really tells us a lot of information, uh, first, about how the right side of the heart is doing, because ultimately all veins drain into the right side of the heart, um, so if the right side of the heart is functioning well or poorly, um, that can be reflected in the central venous pressure. And in addition to that, um, the fluid volume status, uh, we look at that with the CVP as well. We talk about people that are hypovolemic or um, have some sort of vasodilatory problem. Um, we, we can find that uh, fairly easily monitoring the central venous pressure. And then the last thing we'll talk about is the art line or the arterial line generally um, inserted into a, either a, uh, a peripheral artery, sometimes a central artery, um, such as a femoral artery. And what we monitor there, we monitor blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, and of course uh, it can uh, be a conduit uh, for drawing um, laboratory samples. Generally that'll be the form of an arterial blood gas. So on subsequent videos we'll talk a little more about uh, monitoring hemodynamics invasively through these three different uh, modalities and hopefully make some sense. Okay, guys, take care. We'll see you later.